welcome again to Dixie Baptist Church. There's a few of us here in our auditorium, and we are again live streaming our 5.30 Sunday evening service. Thank you. I trust you were able to connect with us this morning at 10 o'clock. But uh, let me just give this word of explanation before we actually start singing together some. As I understand it, and don't ask me to explain it because I don't know. All I can tell you is, if you have a Facebook account, Facebook Live, and you'll get the live stream at the time we're doing this. You can also go to the Dixie Baptist Church website, which is www.dixiebaptist.org, and use our web page, web home, web home page, to click on the live stream and get it there. If you try to go to like Google Chrome to go to YouTube or the YouTube app, it won't carry it. There's too much of a load, as I've been told. So there's two ways right now, Facebook Live, Dixie Baptist website, live stream tab, and you'll find it live. After the fact, when we're done, it'll obviously stay on those uh, mediums, and you'll be able to tune in, and we'll put it up on the YouTube uh, channel again. But uh, that won't be live. It'll be recorded. So <clears throat> if you want to watch us live right now, you're in the right place. All right? But you might want to call your family, your friends, text, email, whatever else you do to get them to understand that uh, we're starting our evening service tonight. And uh, again, we want this to be an encouragement, a blessing, a help to us during uh, these days. So we're going to again sing a few songs together. We'll have a special number. We'll have a challenge from God's word. And uh, trust you'll be encouraged tonight as we think about trusting God. He is exalted. The king is exalted on high. Let's sing out to him right there where you are. We'll sing here. He is exalted. The King is exalted on high. I will praise him. He is exalted forever. Exalted and I will
I trust that you are there as we are here, realizing we are coming together before our God to give our heart, to give our lives, to give our attention, to give our obedience and service to our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Let's pray together right now. And again, I will encourage you to pray right there where you are with those that have gathered around as I lead us here. And let's pray for our nation. Let's pray for our world. Let's pray for President Trump. He's got the weight of the world on his shoulders. Personally, I think he's doing a pretty good job. I think that, uh, again, he may be surprising some folks the way he's handling things. But, uh, you know, it's nothing we ask for. And as we're dealing with it, uh, our leaders have that concern as well. So as we pray together, not just pray for ourselves, intercede for someone else. That's part of prayer. Thank the Lord for his goodness and blessing. And uh, uh, let's make our request known unto him, but let's also praise his name as we come together and have a conversation with our God. Heavenly Father, again, we come before you. First of all, Lord, we want to thank you. That, Lord, your word tells us and we believe that you are in charge. You're on your throne. You're in control. These days have not surprised you. Lord, maybe we're not all aware of it at this time, but, Lord, there's an excitement to see what you are going to do bringing us through this. And, Lord, maybe you're allowing some of this for, partly for the reason of, of reminding us of who you are and, Lord, who we are. Lord, it's many times in our desperation and our real sense of need where we realize that many times we can't even help ourselves. We don't know what to do. But Father, you do. And you want to draw us close to yourself. You want us to lift up our, our eyes, our lives, our hearts to you again. And uh, <clears throat> come to you, come before you, and worship you. That means, Lord... We understand that everything you say is true and everything you do is right. And Lord, when we believe that, when we understand that, Lord, then it's easy for us to surrender ourselves, to bow our hearts, to bow our knees to your will and your way. So Lord, I pray that you would cast out fear. I pray that you would bring peace and comfort, even joy to our hearts as we are reminded during this time together that we belong to you if we have trusted you as our personal savior lord if there's someone out there that's connected with us through this medium i pray lord that you would help them if they don't know the lord that they would simply realize that all have sinned and come short of the glory of god help them to realize that there's a payment for sin the wages of sin is death but the gift of god is eternal life through jesus christ our lord helps to realize that in that payment you made for us and father we would call we would invite you to come into our heart to forgive our sins and to save us and knowing that whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be saved that's your promise and lord i pray that right now folks are even turning to you and lord that that will be an ongoing factor not just when times may be difficult and unpleasant but lord every day in our life we recognize our true dependence on you and our need of you lord we're asking you to help we're asking you to heal uh, we're asking you to hear our prayer and father i want to pray for our president president trump i want to pray for our leaders in the congress even here in our state lord i pray that you'd give them your wisdom man's wisdom falls far short it cannot match your wisdom but lord may we be in tune with you maybe we, we be seeking uh, what you have for us and so i ask that you give them their assurance that they need give them the calmness and the conviction to make the the right biblical type of decisions trusting in you and father when this passes and it will we'll know who to thank we'll be reminded who we need to praise and for that we look forward to and lord i pray as the president has already indicated lord he's trying to get uh, these certain orders and so forth over with so the churches in our country can meet together on Easter Sunday. That's only a couple of weeks away. And Father, what a blessed Easter Sunday that would be if we can all come back to the house of the Lord as your family together and praise you, worship you, honor you, glorify you, and thank you for your word, and for your help, and your protection. 
So, Father, bless this time to your glory and our good, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you, and thank you, the Lord Jesus Christ. What he's given to us, what he offers us today, is his amazing grace. Here's a takeoff on that old gospel song, Amazing Grace. It's all because of that. Sing it out with us. trust uh, that has been a blessing to you at home to sing with us. Thank you, ladies. Uh, we're going to make a couple of switches here. Uh, Norm Thompson, come on up, <clears throat> and we're going to sing a song. And if you give me a second, I need a little water. All right. Thank you, fellas. Here's a song that... I trust will be a blessing and a help to you during this time. You may not have thought about it this way, but 
How many of you realize that the Apostle Paul uh, was sheltered in, what do they say, shelter in place? Sheltered in place. How many realize that the Apostle Paul was sheltered in place on more than one occasion? He was confined. He couldn't get out. He couldn't go to Walmart. Couldn't go to the grocery store. He was in prison. Acts chapter 16 tells us the story. He's in jail, and yet he does a couple of things. One, he writes one of the books of the New Testament. God knew all about that. God had a purpose for the Apostle Paul being there. And while he was exactly where God wanted him to be, the Bible says at midnight they began to sing praises to the Lord. And a couple of miraculous things happened. One, their shackles fell off, the prison doors were open, and uh, the jailer thought that all of the prisoners had escaped. And uh, I imagine that partly was because if you were in prison like that, and all of a sudden that happened with a great earthquake, you might want to stop singing for just a minute to figure out what was going on. So I think the Philippian jailer didn't hear too much going on. He figured all the Prisoners had escaped, and he was about ready to take his own life because somebody else would have anyway because he failed in his duty. And yet the Apostle Paul called out and said, Do yourself no harm. We're all here. And God used the Apostle Paul and his friend Silas to bring glory to him. The most miraculous thing that took place was not the fact that their shackles were loosened and the prison doors were open. The most amazing thing was that that jailer because of Paul's testimony in that time and in that place, he trusted Christ as his Savior. The Apostle Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. It's an incredible story to me. The jailer washed their wounds, took them then to his house. They left the prison overnight. They had a revival meeting, and guess what? Just like Paul said, the jailer's entire household was saved. And then they went back to jail till the next morning. I find that, to me, amusing and just incredible how God used that to bring glory to himself. This is no time for the believer to be sad and despondent and fearful and sorrowful and somber. This is time to sing because that shows we're trusting in God, not ourselves. And God wants to hear you sing. chains were fastened tight down at the jail that night still Paul and Silas would not be dismayed they said it's time to lift our voice sing praises to the Lord let's prove that we will trust him come what may God wants to hear you sing When the waves are crashing round you When the fiery darts surround you When despair is all you see God wants to hear your voice When the wisest man has spoken And says your circumstances As hopeless as can be that's when God wants to hear you say. He loves to hear our praise on our cheerful days when the pleasant times outweigh the bad by far. But when suffering comes along And we still sing Him songs That is when we bless the Father's heart God wants to hear you sing When the winds are crashing round you When the fiery darts surround you when 
despair is all you see. God wants to hear your voice when the wisest man has spoken and says your circumstances as hopeless as can be. That's when God wants to songs in the night. Psalmist said so, and Job himself said so. I'd like for you to take your Bibles, if you will, please, tonight, and if you have them on a digital edition, as I say here in our church, if you have an old hard copy, a paper edition, then turn, if you have a digital uh, copy, then you can tap. So turn and tap, and the last couple of services, I know um, last Wednesday night I gave a uh, an encouraging word from uh, the Psalms, and uh, uh, last Sunday morning uh, I preached, was it last Sunday morning? Before, yeah, Psalm 91, that was a couple weeks ago, and then Psalm 19, and uh, then uh, Psalm uh, 118 this past uh, Wednesday night, and uh, this morning was from the Psalms, uh, finding that faith that we need that's unshakable, in uh, Psalm 27. And so tonight, if you will, please turn your Bible to the book of Proverbs. I want to show you that I know more of the Bible than just one book, the Psalms. But uh, we're going to divert a little bit, and I want you to look at a couple of familiar verses of Scripture, a passage of Scripture that you've probably known most of your Christian life. We quote, uh, we think about, we talk about, but, uh, you know, as in a lot of things, some things are easier said than done. And so I want to look at it tonight, if you will. We'll just look down in Proverbs chapter number 3. And <clears throat> let's look at verse number 3. Proverbs 3, verse 3. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Of course, God is all merciful. He's the God of all mercy. He's the God of all truth. So he's not talking just about, well, be kind and merciful to people and, and don't lie. He is really in this way calling attention to the God that we serve who is merciful and all truth. And so don't get in a place where that's hard to find. He's forsaken. Bind them on thy heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. And then these verses, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Can we just say, quote, read that one more time together? Think about it. Clear your heart, your mind, your thoughts, the distractions around, and meditate as we repeat these two verses, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Say them out loud there with me, if you will, please. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. 
We decide who or whom we will trust. We will either lean to our own understanding or we will trust someone else's understanding. I would encourage us to realize that the best person to trust is the Lord our God. You know, it's even possible, sometimes even easy, for even a believer, a child of God, to lean to their own understanding. Well, this is the way I've always done it. Well, this is the way it's worked before. Well, th this is how people do it, and, and so it must be all right this time. You know, God has a way of mixing it up a little bit. Now, he still has the same goal. He still has the same agenda. His purpose for our lives is to help us be more like the Lord Jesus Christ once we're saved and a child of God. And uh, we need to understand that in our lives, <clears throat> what the Lord has done uh, for us, we cannot be saved if we don't trust God. We've put our faith, that's trust, that, that's reliance. We put our trust in him for our soul's salvation. That's an eternal decision everyone's going to make. If a person chooses not to trust, believe, have faith, confidence, reliance on God and what he said, that's a whole different path to follow. That's a whole nother end. The Bible says there is a way that seems right unto a man. It seems right unto a man. But the warning is, but that, that's the way of death, destruction, even hell. Jesus said broad is the way that leads to hell. Narrow is the way that leads to life ever standing, uh, 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 everlasting. And the reason it's narrow is because there's only one way there, and that's through Jesus Christ. And we hear that news. We receive God's word. The Holy Spirit uh, does something in our heart to, to draw us uh, to that truth, and then we place our confidence. Well, if that's true, if that's what God has said, I'm going to believe that. I'm going to put my trust in that. And we do. If we will confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, the word confess means to agree with God, Romans 10, 9. If you will confess, if you will agree with God, the Lord Jesus, what does God say about Jesus Christ? What does the Bible say about Jesus Christ? I don't care what some uh, unbeliever says. I don't care what some so-called religious expert or uh, somebody that, that has their faith in something else. It doesn't matter what they say. We have to confess what God says about Jesus Christ. You know what God says about Jesus Christ? God says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. When we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, we, we understand we are agreeing with God. That's what the word confess means. When someone makes a confession, it could be in a court of law, it could be some other place, that they're agreeing, all right? So if I will agree, confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus, and then believe, have faith, trust, confidence in my heart. The heart is the center of who I am. It's the seat of my intellect, my emotions, and, and my will. It's, it's, it's the very inner being of all of us. If you will believe, have that confidence in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. By the way, there's no question whether Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. As a matter of fact, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most documented fact of human history. There are other things that have happened in history that we're told, and there's only a few resources, but we believe them to be so. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can look it up in other books and other libraries, other writings of the folks from back in that time. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. There are over 5,000 documented records of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Besides that, the Bible says that after his resurrection, he was seen by numbers of people at one time, 500 people on one occasion, and people saw Jesus in his resurrected, glorified body, as well as all the disciples and others in that area. There is no dispute that Jesus Christ had been raised from the dead. And since that is true, not if, since that is true, <laughs> if someone doesn't believe it, that's a problem. That that's not a matter of a lack of evidence. Luke, in the first chapter of the book of Acts, says we have many infallible, undeniable, full proof, proofs of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
You can't deny the truth. You can't deny the fact. All you can do is reject it. But if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness or doing right, doing the right thing. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Jesus said you believe in God. He was speaking to his disciples of all people in John 14. You believe in God, believe also in me. And he gave us that great passage of Scripture, the 14th chapter of John, when he told us he was going to go prepare a place and one day come and receive us unto himself that where he is, we will be always and also. But he said, you believe in God, believe in me. There are people throughout our world today that would agree that there's a God. They might call it a higher power or a force or something else. But I'm here to remind you, as I mentioned this morning, God has a name, and his name is Jehovah. God has a name. His name is Jesus. He is our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, according to what Paul said in Titus chapter number 3. So, how do I get saved? If I confess that, if I believe that, the Bible says I, I, I meet the qualifications for, for being a child of God, then whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. My calling, my inviting is merely the act that demonstrates what's going on inside. It's not the prayer that saves you. It's not necessarily the, the, the uh, understanding. It's the actual answering of the invitation. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. When Jesus called all his disciples, he merely said basically the same thing, maybe with a, a little different twist on it, depending on who he's talking to. But it's just as we sang the song earlier, you know what Jesus said? Come. Just, just come. Come and see. And those of us that have come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we've seen who he is. We've put our trust in him for our eternals, eternal soul salvation. I mentioned that this morning. That's the biggest thing. That's the most difficult thing. And then God wants to get us to have that same kind of trust every day of our lives. If you can trust God, if you can trust the Lord Jesus Christ with your eternal destiny, if you can trust God with the hereafter based on what he has said, and you will confess that you believe that, then why can't we trust him for today? Why can't we trust him when things seem to be going well as opposed to when things seem to be not going so well? It's easy to trust God in the good times and the pleasant times. Tom just sang about it. The pleasant times outweigh the bad by far. I think that's mostly true in our lives because we're a child of the king. But if we can't trust God in days like this, confusing, harmful, I hope not to you fearful, but, you know, just that, that concern that we have. The way out of that and the remedy for that is put your trust in God. There's three things I see in this passage of Scripture that are, I think, kind of simple. I'm kind of a simple guy, and I like it that way and helps me understand it. But I want to state three things to you, and then I want to look at these two verses, and let me help you with this. First of all, understand these three clear Bible truths. I mentioned it this morning Number one, God is completely sovereign. He's in charge. He's in control. He's the creator of all things. He knows how it works. He knows how it got broken. He knows how he can fix it. He is sovereign. He rules in the affairs of men. The angel Gabriel told that to Daniel. Everything that's happening in our world, <laughs> listen to me. God's well aware. He's controlling it all. That doesn't mean he's making it happen. He's, he's causing problems. Sin did that. The devil did that. But the devil wants us to get, uh, get people to blame God, and he wins two ways. He causes the fear. He causes the panic. And then people unthinkingly turn around and start blaming God, and I believe the devil sits back and just laughs. But God will have the last laugh. Psalm chapter 2, I'll go ahead and refer to another psalm. 
The Bible says, why do the heathen, that's the unbeliever, those that don't acknowledge God, why do they rage and imagine vain, empty, worthless things as if they can solve all of man's problems? The Bible says, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. He'll keep them in derision. Go ahead. Go ahead. Try to figure it out. Sooner or later, you're going to call on me. You're going to need me. My encouragement would be, that would probably be wise to do earlier than later. It'd be wise to do now than before it's too late. But in this passage of Scripture, we need to understand that God is completely sovereign. Number two, he's infinite in wisdom. He knows everything about us. He knows his plans. He says, I know the plans I have for you. You see, God is at work. It's not just the everyday affairs of life. God is infinite. That means limitless in his wisdom. The ways of God are past finding out. And every once in a while someone says, I found out something. The only way we can find out anything about God is from what he tells us in his word, how he reveals himself to us talks about his attributes his characteristics who he is what his plan is there's one general theme that goes from the book of Genesis through all 66 books of the Bible to the book of the Revelation and it is the story of redemption in and through Jesus Christ alone in the beginning God that's God the Father God the Holy Spirit moved as he energized the creation that God had given. And God said, well, John 1 says the one who spoke is the word of God. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. In the first three verses of the Bible and the book of Genesis, you see God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son all present, and you see them at the end and all the way through. You see, God is unveiling and revealing his plan to us. One of these days, as far as we're concerned here on planet Earth, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return to this earth with his saints, with those that have put their trust in him. He is going to set up a kingdom, and the angel Gabriel told this to Mary in Luke chapter number 1, of his kingdom there shall never be an end. He hasn't set up that kingdom yet. He's going to set up his kingdom and it's going to last forever. I think one of the longest reigning kingdoms on the face of the earth was probably the Roman Empire for 500 years. That's it. That's tops. America's what? Only a couple of hundred, not even 300 years of age yet. And we've had our growing pains and everything else. It's kind of hard to fathom. A thousand year earthly rule of the Lord Jesus Christ here on planet earth. And according to the word of God, then eternity begins and his kingdom truly will never have an end. And that's the whole story of the Bible and God trying to reveal it to us. Show us who he is, not just what he can do. But God is completely sovereign. God is infinite in wisdom. And the third truth I want you to think about, because we'll come back to them at the end, God is perfect in love. Perfect in love. Well, how could a loving God fill in the blank? Here's my question. How could a loving God allow sin? How could a loving God continue to let people go their own way, which is to destruction? How could a loving God, you know, just let people do and hope it all works out at the end? That's not love. The Bible says that if a father loves his child, he will discipline, he will chastise, he will correct. And God does that, and maybe God's taking that on a grand scale. Uh, I don't hold a lot in this, but I was amused when I, <laughs> when I saw this someone posted, and I think it's been copied and so forth. Uh, this kind of shows that God maybe is a little upset with all of us, and he sent us to our rooms. Now, I don't know about all of that, but, uh, you know, there, there, there is something that we better be aware of and keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, keep our eyes on God, because his plan is not going to be thwarted or stopped. He will accomplish everything he's ever promised. 1 John chapter 4, I think it's verse 18, talks about perfect love that casts out fear. God's perfect love for us, and then the passage goes on to say we love him because he first loved us and we have that kind of relationship with him there, there's nothing to fear 
There's nothing to be afraid of. Perfect love casts out fear. And maybe this is the time God's trying to call us back to him in love. Well, here's the three things I see out of this passage. First of all, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. The next phrase, lean not to thine own understanding. Number one, trust the Lord exclusively. No one else. Put your ultimate, supreme confidence, trust, reliance, belief on the Lord. Don't just trust the things he has done. Don't just trust the things that he has given. You know, in the Old Testament, the people came out of Israel, the Jews, and they're out there in the wilderness, and Moses is trying to instruct them and, and get them ready to enter the promised land. And time after time, they complain, we don't have water, we don't have food, we don't have this. We're going to go back. <laughs> That's not the answer. That's not the solution. They were leaning to their own understanding. They were showing, and we show and prove all the time, who and what we trust. If we're not trusting God exclusively, we're going to be fooled. We're going to be led astray. In the Garden of Eden, God had given some instructions to Adam. The devil comes along and says, did God really say if you eat of that tree, you won't die? Well, yeah, I think that's kind of what he said. All of a sudden, mistrust in God's word was planted in Eve's mind. The devil knew that. He is the author of confusion. He's a liar. He's a murderer. All the problems in this world that we face all the time, and especially now with this globally, it's the devil's doing. It's not God's. How much should you trust a liar? How much should we trust someone who's a rebel against God? Why not trust God for who he is? Trust God exclusively lean not to your own understanding let me say it this way trust him only and only trust him a lot of times when someone says hey trust me <laughs> somebody said that's probably a good reason not to they might have uh, their own agenda they might, they might have ulterior motives but when God, the Bible declares, who is trustworthy, he is worthy of our trust. He's proved it time and time and time again. God is able. Maybe you've had the experience like I did, <clears throat> trying to teach your children maybe to swim. And, of course, all our kids are grown. Now we've got grandkids. But I remember, you know, being at a pool someplace, maybe a hotel, maybe, maybe vacation. And, you know, you got the parent uh, you know, that's in the water, in the pool. And it's the shallow end, you know, it may be less than three feet deep. And the little child is standing there on the, the side. And here's the parent, you know, got their arms out wanting to catch the little child. And the little child is standing there. In our case, it was all girls. And they're standing there. And I said, jump to dad, jump to dad. And you know how they do, they hesitate. You know what the problem is? They're not sure they can trust. Um, I don't know what they always thought, but I don't want any harm to come to my children. I don't want them to go under the water and come up spitting and gagging. I don't want all of that. And sometimes we think, well, trusting God, we just leap out into the unknown. <laughs> no, 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 no. When we trust God, we're actually jumping into the arms of a loving, heavenly Father. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Why trust someone else? He has even strength to do the impossible. We talk about God's providence. God's providence. That comes from two Greek words, pro, and one we all know, video. A video is something you see. Pro, the little prefix means to go before. Providence, pro-video means that God sees before it ever happened because he's eternal. He sees the beginning from the end. He sees everything in between. I like it at one time. I was driving out west, and I could see a train going down the tracks across the uh, desert there in northern Arizona, 
And uh, it's one of the first times I see it. You know, I waited at, at uh, train stops and so forth on the highways around here. And, you know, you sit there and you probably like me. You've counted the train cars or you try to look down and see, man, is that the last one? When can we go and so forth? But as I'm driving down, I guess I'm heading west on I-40 going across uh, Arizona there. And I looked over and I saw this train. And I don't know. I mean, it was off in the distance, uh, this side of the mountains. And I could see the train engine, and I could look all the way down the track and see the train caboose, and I could see everything in the middle. I could look ahead because of the flat horizon, and I could see where he was headed. I could see about where he'd come from, and the thought hit me, that's just how God sees my life. He sees the very beginning. He sees the very end. He sees everything in between. He sees what's up ahead. Pro video. You can trust in God's providence, and he's revealing himself today. Trust the Lord exclusively. Number two, with all thine heart. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Trust the Lord entirely. Entirely. Half trust, partial trust is not enough. That's what I meant when I said if you can trust the Lord for your soul's salvation and your eternal destiny, why can't you trust him for Monday? Tuesday. You trusted him, I hope, in 2019. Why can't we trust him in 2020 or 2021 or however many days he gives us? And if he comes, we're all going to be together with him if you know Christ is your personal Savior. Trust the Lord exclusively. Trust the Lord entirely. Just because I may not understand or just because I may not know really what God says or does doesn't give me the right to determine that he must be mistaken in what he has said or done. Well, why would God do this? Did God do that? I, I, I'm no one to judge God. I need to trust God entirely. I don't know how it flies with this generation in which we live, but back when I was a kid, preachers used to say all the time, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Now we want to question everything. We want to debate everything. Well, could God do this? Why would he do that? And, 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 you know, we, we try to find fault with God. That's not trusting God entirely. But the Bible is right, and I believe it is, and says who God is. There's no reason why we should not be able to trust him entirely with our lives. Our self-reliance gets in the way for God to work. If I think I've got God figured out, if I think, now the Bible, I, I stay within the bounds of the Bible, we do what God tells us to do, and yet throughout the Bible, people got ahead of God, they got behind God, they tried to catch up with God. Even the Apostle Peter, he stood in God's way <laughs> when the Lord told him he was going to Jerusalem to die, and Peter jumped in front and said, no! Can you imagine telling God no? God knows what he was doing, and by the way, he used a definitive term. He called Peter an adversary. Our word is Satan. He said, get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking, savoring. You're not, have your mind on the things that I need to accomplish. In other words, he wasn't on the same page with the Lord. I remember a message my dad used to preach about the rich man and Lazarus. You know, the beggar Lazarus sat at the rich man's gate, and the Bible says, first of all, he died, and the angels carried him to heaven. Not too long after that, Jesus said, the rich man died, and in hell he lifted up his eyes and saw Lazarus in Abraham's bosom, one of those poetic uh, phrases of heaven, paradise, where God is. And God said, after the man requested, he said, just, just send someone to give me some water. Send someone to tell my brothers. And God said, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, basically in that day, the Old Testament. Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the law. And the prophets, that's everything that happened up until Malachi, before the New Testament era. So Jesus was saying, if you're not going to understand and believe the Bible, what they had at that time, it says, neither... Will they believe? <laughs> the one came back from the dead to tell them two things. First of all, somebody did come back from the dead and tell us his name is Jesus Christ. 
The resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees victory over sin, our flesh, and the devil. I remember my dad saying, can you imagine a man in hell? Because when, when the Lord said, let him hear the Bible, the Old Testament, Moses and the prophets, the rich man said, from hell to heaven, not so, no. And he used to say, can you imagine a man in hell telling a person in heaven, no. Who's got it figured out? Who understands the truth? But it shows our pride. It shows our self-reliance. It, it shows where we are. The only thing that dishonors the Lord is my disobedience. And disobedience comes because I really don't trust him. If I trust what someone says, I'll, I'll have an easy time believing them. I, I believe they have it, you know, for my best interest. I believe they have the right thing. And, and so because I believe that, I will trust them. You'll have a hard time believing anybody. It could be a parent. It could be a, a family relationship uh, relationship situation it could be a pastor of a church it could be the the law it, it could be god if you don't trust them you're gonna have a harder time obeying them and the sin of unbelief not trusting god has devastating consequences trust god exclusively trust god entirely verse number six trust in the lord with all thine heart Lean not to thine own understanding. In what? All thy ways. Not some, not most. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. That's his promise. Acknowledge him. Trust the Lord exclusively with all thine heart entirely. Acknowledging him to direct your paths. Trust the Lord entirely expectantly expectantly does God give us some wonderful promises how do I know my my direction will be guided how, how do I know he will lead well the Bible says in the book of Proverbs the steps of a righteous man a man that's right with the Lord are guided by the Lord he directs every one of them you can't trust the Lord exclusively you ought to and need to trust the Lord entirely, wholeheartedly, no hesitation, no hold back. But you also need to trust the Lord expectantly. If you will acknowledge me, I'll direct your paths. If you'll follow me, I'll lead you where you need to go. If you will submit to me, I'll give you the best that I can give. That's what God says. You can trust God expectantly. In our grief, it exalts us to the level of our dependence on God and our awareness of it. Our troubles help to lift us up and get us out of that self-reliant mode. I did a lot of years of coaching, and I've said this, and I learned this biblical truth because of some personal experiences. It was there all the time. It just connected with me in this way. We were fortunate and blessed enough that, you know, we won many, many games. We, we won more games, I'm glad to say, than, than we ever lost. We won many championships, many tournaments, you know, and, and I'm thankful that, you know, we worked hard and, and uh, as they say, the guys bought into our system and what we were doing. And, and back when I was coaching, God, God really blessed that way. But I want to tell you something. I, I was always nervous if we won a big game or even a close game or one even maybe we expected to win, I was always concerned about the next game. How are we going to do that? How are we going to play? How, what's our attitude going to be? Sometimes we thought we should win. We thought we would win. And a few times, obviously, we didn't win. But I learned this. I learned more in the defeats than I did in the victories. And I thought I took the victories for granted. I was thankful for every one of them. But the truth of the matter is, when, when there's a defeat, when there's a loss, when there's a disappointment... It kind of helps you reevaluate. Maybe I need to work on something. Maybe we need to adjust something. Maybe we need to change something so we can do it right, so we can do it better. And that's the way in our life as a Christian. Sometimes God allows these difficulties to help us get realigned, refocused, renewed with him. An expectation of his promise to lead. <clears throat> if I may, one... 
other illustration. The girls were small in our family, and I can't remember which house it was, but I remember I had at least the older ones. I don't know if it was, you know, all of them. I think it was before then, but I remember Danielle, our oldest daughter. She was probably, oh, at least maybe 10 or 12, so you can do the math after that because a pile of kids kept coming after her. But anyway, I had the kids there, and I was trying to get Heather and maybe Tiffany, and we're doing this. You, you've heard it. You've seen it. You've probably even done it, this trust fall you know, where someone stands behind someone and they say, you know, just fall back and I'll catch you. And uh, <laughs> I remember talking to a couple of the girls and I was standing behind them. They're just little, little girls, you know, and I said, just, just fall back. Just, just lean back and keep on going and daddy will catch you. And boy, you know how they did. They'd, they'd start and they'd, they'd be looking. They, they would stop themselves and, and they'd check. Are you, are you there? And they, they just hesitated. I don't know where Danny was, but she walked in the house, and I said, Danny, come here. She says, what, Dad? And I said, I want to do a trust fall. Turn around. What do you want to do? She says, turn around. Fall back, and I'll catch you. She said, okay. She turned around. Whew, almost surprised me, but I caught her. And the other girls, I said, see, girls? Dad's not going to let you fall. Dad's not going to let you hurt yourself. You can trust me. No matter what happens in our life, let me encourage you. Trust God exclusively don't put your trust in anything else including yourself your heart your own understanding trust the Lord entirely with everything with everything don't let there be anything in your life in which you don't trust him for the good things, for the difficult things, for the heartbreaking things, for the challenging things, for the disappointing things, just keep trusting the Lord entirely and trust the Lord expectantly. Because when we have that kind of trust in Him, it is simply amazing what He does to show us how much He loves us and keeps His word to us. Remember those three truths that I talked about? Well, how can I trust the Lord exclusively? How can I trust the Lord entirely? How can I trust the Lord expectantly? <laughs> God is completely sovereign. God is infinite in his wisdom. God is perfect in his love. And a God like that, you can trust. God in his love will always do what is best for us. In his wisdom, he always knows what's best for us. And in his sovereignty, he has the power to do what is best for us. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean to your own understanding in every way, all your way. You acknowledge him. You give him the credit that is due him. And he shall direct your paths. God bless you. If you haven't trusted him as Savior, I encourage you to do so, even right now, right there where you are. Just invite the Lord to forgive your sin, come into your heart and save you. And he'll do exactly what he said he would do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love, your mercy, your goodness. Thank you for these truths that we've been able to share tonight from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Any believer any length of time certainly knows these two verses. But Lord, again, we don't just need to say them and know them. We need to do them. So, Father, help us, especially in times like this, that we may trust you only, exclusively, we may trust you wholeheartedly, entirely. We may trust you expecting what you're going to do for us because you are a God of your word. Your truth will not fail. And we'll thank you for who you are. If someone doesn't know you as their personal Savior, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will indeed help them to call on you right now to acknowledge you, to confess what they believe in their heart. And Lord, as they ask you to forgive them, help them to have the assurance that you have done exactly what you said. If you will ask me, I will save you.
Father, for that we give you thanks. As believers, may we have a witness and a testimony that is clear and shows that our confidence is not in man and even the supply chain. Our confidence is in God. May this be a time when you're drawing people to yourself in either salvation or sanctification or even service. And Lord, there'll even be an awakening of believers and in the church that the testimony of Jesus Christ might be better known in this world. To you who is able to keep us from falling and to present us holy before a heavenly Father, all wise now and forever be glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us and tuning in tonight or connecting with us. We're going to sing one stanza to finish up this uh, service tonight. And uh, the words come from an old song, but uh, there's a new tune to it. We've been singing here in our church, and uh, we want to sing it and most of you are aware of it and let me just remind you and thank you by the way for those of you that are sending in your tithes and offerings we've received some of them in the mail this past week uh, some of you have dropped them off during the office hours that uh, we've had to abbreviate obviously you can go online and uh, hit the the uh, tab that has uh, online giving but there's a percentage taken out for that from uh, the company that uh, services that or you can set up a bill pay with your banking institution and uh, remember, we have needs too, and we're trusting God to provide for us, but he provides for us as Christians are obedient. If there was a time I was going to kind of hold back on God, this wouldn't be it. He's showing something to us, our need of him. And may God bless and help us to continue to encourage hearts in the ministry he's given us. We're going to sing together, and we'll be done until Wednesday night, and we'll see you at uh, 6.30, again on Facebook Live and on our church website live stream tab. My hope is built on Jesus' blood and righteousness. My hope is built. family know they can also join us this is now recorded and it'll be available on Facebook live our live stream from our website and they'll be posting it to YouTube directly as well share it God bless you we'll see you next time